Hello everyone and welcome. In today's video tutorial we're going to discuss what is the difference between the equals operator and the equals method when comparing Java objects. Now this is the equals operator and this is the equals method. Let us recall that in Java classes and objects record state and behavior or maintain state and behavior. So I have a simple class here, a class that describes a person. So the state of this class or object, otherwise known as attributes, are name and age. So a person has a name and an age. This is a really simple class. Now behavior is modeled in Java classes and objects via methods. So this class here, as it happens, has only one method. It's an equals method, which I'll speak about shortly. So let's have a look at an example here. I have a compare objects demo class that consists of one main method and I have instantiated, declared and instantiated a person object. So this is our person class, this is our object reference person1, that's our declaration and then this part here is our instantiation. So we declare a new person whose name is Martin and whose age is 21. I'm now going to declare a new person, a second person, and I'm going to call that, well first of all, the object reference will be called person2, and the person name will be called Eva, and the age will be say 20. Okay, so I've now two persons. Now it's pretty clear that Martin and Eva are not the same person. So I'm now going to compare these two persons using both the equality operator and the equals method. Let's print out the results of a comparison operation using both the equality operator and the equals method. So say system.out.println and let's take the first one. Person1 is equals person2. So that will simply evaluate this expression and print out either true or false. Now we'll do the same thing except this time we'll use the equals method. So I'm going to have to invoke person1.equals person2. OK. Before we run this program, let's first try and understand exactly what is going on. So let's have a look. So let's take the first statement, person person1. Just imagine the Java virtual machine has executed just this part of the statement. What it does is it declares an object reference that is capable of holding the address in memory of a person object. So what exactly is this? Well, <clears throat> if this is a 32-bit machine, this would be a 4-byte variable. If it was a 64-bit machine, it would be an 8-byte variable. And it holds the address in memory of a person object. Now, if we had just declared, for example, this, this here would be initialized to null like that. But that's not what we had. What we had was we had both a declaration and an instantiation. So the instantiation says invokes the new keyword, which tells the operating system, I want a blob of memory. The operating system says, I've no idea what a, how big a blob is. How big do you want it? The Java virtual machine says, I don't know, but I know who does know. The person constructor knows. So I'm going to pass to you the person constructor, and the person can give whatever memory the, the constructor asks for. So the constructor requires whatever memory is necessary to store the state Martin and the age 21, the name Martin and the age 21. It then returns that blob of memory <coughs> and it identifies the address in memory of that blob and it stores the address in memory in the object reference. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume the address in memory is 1234, for simplicity. Okay, so this is the state of the Java virtual machine after the first statement has been executed. In a similar way, when a second statement is executed, person2, a new object reference is created that is capable of holding the address in memory of a person object. And then it is instantiated with a new object, so a new blob of memory that stores the name Eva and the age 20, and then the address of this blob in memory let's say for simplicity it's 5857, it is stored in the object reference that is called person2. Okay, so that's the state of this, the system. Now, we have arrived at the heart of the question. So we have 
the equals operator and the equals method. So what exactly happens here? Well, when we evaluate this expression, person one equals person two using the equals operator, what this operation actually does is it compares the object references with each other. So it checks the value inside the object reference of person one, is it equal to the value inside the object reference of person two? Basically, in simple English, it's checking the value of the memory locations. Are the memory locations the same? If I want to be a little bit technical, it actually checks two things. The first thing it checks is, are these object references both of type person? That's the first thing it does. And the second thing it does is then checks is the memory location stored in each of them the same? Is the values of these object references, and by values I mean the memory locations, I don't mean the objects. That's crucial. This distinction is crucial. So the equality operator effectively compares the object references. Now on the other hand, the equals method does not compare the object references. The equals method compares the states of the, the state of the objects with each other. It checks is the name Martin in this person one object the same as the name in the person two object and is the age in the person one object the same as the age in the person two object. Now if we 10 attributes here and 10 attributes here it would check all 10 attributes with each other. Again, these objects must be of the same type. So, in a nutshell, that is a crucial difference between the equals operator and the equals method. Okay. It is time to go into some more advanced technical information. So, what I've told you so far is correct. The equality operator compares the object references and the equals method compares the object data. But now to clarify, the equals method compares the object data precisely because I have provided an equals method as part of the person class. And the equals method explicitly checks each of the attributes. So it receives an object of type person, P, and it checks the, the object that it receives, the name of the state of that object, the attribute name of that object, is it the same as the name of the object we're in? Basically it compares the name of one object with the name of the other in simple English and the age of one object with the age of the other. Okay, so that's clear. What if I didn't provide that method? What if our class does not have that method? What would happen? Now this is the advanced technical information. Well, actually the equals method is defined in the object class from which every class is either a direct or indirect descendant. And by default, the equals method in the object class, believe it or not, behaves in the exact same way as the equality operator. So it, the key point I'm trying to make here is if you don't define your own equals method, the default behavior of the equals method as defined by the superclass object actually behaves in the same way as the quality operator. This is important because you may actually now write your own program after watching this video and say, look, I've written my own, I've written a simple class like Martin's demo, but I'm getting completely different behavior. The key point is you must define your own equals method. And in your equals method, what you should check is verify, check each of the attributes. Are they the same as the object you're comparing to? That's all you have to do. So thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or feedback, please leave them as comments to this video and I will try and reply as soon as possible. So thank you very much. Take care.